In a prehistoric veld, morning breaks, and we see a tribe of hominins living in a group among the rocks. Anteater-like creatures also live with them in a friendly manner. The apes tribe periodically drives a competing tribe away from their source and claims the territory as their own. Life goes on like this. Days pass, and nights pass peacefully. One morning, the tribe discovers the presence of a strange and black monolith in front of the cave. They examine it from all sides, but still cannot understand what it is and where it came from. The monolith attracts them, and the tribe constantly wanders near it. One day, a monkey picked up a bone for the first time from a pile of bones. He uses it as a weapon and hunts. After some time, the neighboring tribe again tries to snatch it, but the owners of the lake are now armed with bones, with which they not only drive away the invaders, but also kill one of them. Millions of years have passed, and humanity has been exploring space for a long time, building ships and space stations equipped with the latest technology. Now, space flights have become common. One day, Dr. Haywood Floyd, chairman of the U.S. National Astronautics Council, visits the American lunar outpost, Base Clavius. He arrives at the intermediate station, where he meets the scientist Mr. Miller. He then goes to a terminal with Floyd, who asks the doctor for his ast to provide a full introduction, providing all information about himself, including his country. Floyd meets this requirement, and gains full access to the station's services. His ship is scheduled to take off for the moon in an hour, so he has time to eat. But first, Dr. Floyd wants to call someone and goes to the telephone. He contacts his daughter on Earth, who is celebrating her birthday today. The girl asks for a doll as a gift, and the father promises to fulfill her wish and asks the mother to say hello. After a while, he meets Russian scientists and tells them that he is traveling to the Clavius base. Meanwhile, a Russian man asks them to share the strange things happening there. From reliable sources, scientists have learned that an epidemic has broken out on the station, but Floyd cannot discuss it. He tells them that he is not at liberty to discuss this topic. He bids them goodbye, and the co-workers wish him good luck. During the trip to the moon, Floyd takes a nap while flight attendants deliver healthy meals in special boxes. The flight ends at the Clavius base, where the pilots land the ship on an equipped cosmodrome where people are already waiting for them. Later, Floyd addresses a staff meeting, emphasizing the need to keep their latest discovery a secret. He considers the rumors of an epidemic and believes that the discovery should remain secret, because its publication could cause a major cultural shock. However, he himself considers this decision difficult. Later. Dr. Floyd is taken to the location where an artifact was recently found. Colleagues say that it all started with the discovery of a strange monolith, which was at first mistaken for a piece of magnetic rock, but that nothing could create such a field of force. Then people decided that it was part of some kind of structure, and excavations began, but they found nothing. Furthermore, it was discovered that this object was not sensitive to it. It seems that it was deliberately hidden four million years ago. Scientists arrive at the site and examine a structure. As lunar dawn arrives, the black monolith catches the sun's rays for the first time after millions of years of imprisonment, resulting in a piercing electronic scream heard in the astronauts' headsets. After 18 months, the American spacecraft Discovery 1 is heading towards Jupiter. This is the first journey towards Jupiter. The ship is about half a billion miles from Earth, and the mission is going according to plan so far. Two awake astronauts keep watch every day, and three crew members are in hibernation. All this was done to save oxygen and food, because in hibernation, a person takes only one breath per minute. The entire functioning of the ship is controlled by a supercomputer called HAL 9000, which is capable of mimicking human actions and creating some form of consciousness. It completes tasks at unimaginable speed without any errors. Later, Frank receives a transmission from Earth, and his parents congratulate him on his birthday. They show him the cake they ordered for him and tell him they are proud of Frank. In the evening, David shows Hal some sketches, and the two talk. Curious, Hal questions David if he has any second thoughts about the mission. David doesn't understand what he's trying to say. Hal says he has heard about the uncertainty and emerging stories behind the mission. Apart from this, he also mentioned the strange structure on the moon and unconventional preparations for the journey. Then suddenly, a warning appeared on the system that a unit of the spacecraft had malfunctioned. Hal says he has discovered a problem with one of the antenna control devices, and it will fail 100% within 72 hours. So David only has 72 hours to fix it. If not fixed, it will also affect the life support system. David teams up with Frank and informs Mission Control of the problem, who instructs them to fix it before the system fails. David enters a pod and proceeds to repair the antenna control equipment. He flies carefully into the darkness of space 
and successfully replaces the unit. Coming back, David examines the damaged unit. It turns out that there's nothing wrong with it. To confirm the problem, Hal recommends reinstalling the device and letting it fail. Mission Control reported that data from the backup 9000 computer showed that Hal had made a mistake, but Hal says it was human error. David and Frank choose to have a private conversation in the EVA pod so that Hal won't be able to hear them, because they are worried about Hal's actions. They agree to disconnect Hal if he is proven wrong. However, Hal follows their conversation by lip-reading. As Frank moves away from his pod to replace the antenna unit, Hal unexpectedly takes control of the pod and begins an attack, causing Frank to become separated from the ship and his airline to be cut. David sees him from the window and climbs onto another pod to rescue Frank. While he is out, Hal unexpectedly shuts down the life support functions of the crew members in suspended animation, resulting in their tragic deaths. In the following scenes, David retrieves Frank's body and gets back on the ship. He asks Hal to open the door, but Hal does not answer. After some time, Hal says he can't open the hatch, to which David asks what the problem is. Hal explains that this mission is very important, and he can't let anyone jeopardize it. He says that David and Frank were planning to disconnect him, but he can't let that happen. David says he can get in through the emergency airlock. However, Hal reminds him he doesn't have a helmet, so his effort is futile. Saying this, he ends the conversation. With no other option, David releases Frank's body into space and heads for the emergency airlock. He carefully opens the emergency airlock. However, David cannot enter easily without a helmet, so he carefully positions his pod near the emergency airlock. As he opened the pod's door, he was sucked into Discovery's airlock by vacuum-driven air. David walks through the corridors of the spaceship, and Hal asks what he plans to do, but he ignores it. He goes into Hal's processor core and begins disabling its functioning circuits. Hal begs David not to do so, but David doesn't listen to him at all. When Hal finally deactivates, a video recorded by Floyd 18 months earlier plays, in which he announces that the structure buried beneath the moon's surface is the first discovery of intelligent life outside Earth. And the real objective of the mission was to understand the riddle of the monolith and the mysteries associated with it. Scientists received a radio signal sent by the monolith from Jupiter's orbit, which was the reason the Discovery One mission was sent. David continued his onward flight alone and discovered a third very large monolith orbiting the planet in Jupiter's orbit. He leaves Discovery, boards the pod, and approaches the monolith. As he gets closer, he is drawn into a whirlpool of colored lights, and as he passes by, he sees strange, celestial phenomena and strange landscapes of unusual colors. It seems almost endless. The pod is set in a large, neoclassical bedroom, and David stands in the room wearing a spacesuit, now looking very old and shaky. He walks into the bathroom and looks at his wrinkled skin in the mirror. Such a transformation astounds him. When he looks back, he sees an old man in the room who is none other than David, who is now even older than before. While he is eating, he sees a third version of himself, now lying on his deathbed and pointing towards the black monolith. As David approaches her, he transforms into a fetus, encased in a transparent ball of light, floating in space above the earth. One of the economic interpretations of the monolith in this film is the belief that it may be a symbol of intelligence and knowledge. However, the film's director Stanley Kubrick never explained its true meaning and left it as a seeming mystery. The film inspires the audience to think and create their own meanings and interpretations, allowing each person to understand it from their own perspective.